just going to leave the meeting open so you you can you can do what you want all right being yeah, recorded I'm, 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 yes I'm, I'm, uh, no not uh, anymore recording. well I, i'm uh, oh, I, i'm distracted by that by yourself moving <laughs> but uh, no i just say uh, um, since uh, these are, these are the th things that i think uh, you you know have um, kept me alive all these years out to Thank Mark and uh, all of you for, uh, um, you know, be, being along for this particular ride. Uh, and um, I, I would like to be there. I don't know whether I shall get into the chats particularly, uh, but it would be nice to, uh, to um, you know, be able to, uh, uh, through some through mechanism to, uh, uh, you know, Skype, say, uh, every, everyone, perhaps every so often, uh, you know, having uh, notified them that you'd like to do that and that they were, that they were agreeable. And uh, I don't really have any, uh, any, any list of uh, how, to, how to contact various people. So if somebody could uh, uh, send, that, send that to me, that would be, that, 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 that would be great. Uh, yes, so Carol, my wife, says she doesn't know what what I'm going to do each, e e e each evening now that uh, when you're all gone. <laughs> okay, Peter. Um, thank yep. you. Thank you very much. Okay, Doug, if I mute everybody, I don't need to mute everybody, do I really? Doug, you just go ahead. You're, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I'm number five. I thought you were you number want me to go now. I thought I was number oh, two. You're, right. Colin, you're number two. Sorry, it's people. Colin. Moving. My fault. Yes, it's, it, Colin. it's Colin. Yes, Colin. My fault. Go ahead, Colin. Right. Okay, I just want to, uh, apart from saying thank you, Mark, you've been fantastic. Been lots of interesting talks. Lots of things to think about. I just want to give you one thing to take away with yourselves. Take away and think about a big idea. So here's. I'm going to share screen um, and I want to look at this. Okay, so this is, uh, how do I get that to go the whole screen? There we are. Okay, so this is, uh, you've seen this before in the, in the talk. Uh, this is a galaxy and a, and a companion galaxy and two quasars. And I want to suggest to you that this is mummy, daddy and two children. <laughs> that in fact, the dominant life form in the universe is galaxies. Uh, quasars are baby galaxies. They get chucked out of galaxies and they grow by accretion and they can turn themselves into galaxies. Okay, that's all I want to do. Wow, okay. that's a lovely idea. <laughs> but it's a big, it's big, it's a big idea. Okay. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, Christine. Ah, right. Well, it's just as well I'm number three because mine is about three, so there you are. And it's a verse about the observer observed. You can watch yourself watching yourself watch the pigeons up to no more than the power of three, said the great poet and thinker Paul Valéry. <clears throat> In all the zany talks on Zoom to boom in my little room here by the sea, it's awareness of awareness surely proffers the key. That's why never mind mere recursive diction, it's meta meta fiction now for me. Long live Anpa triple torsion, long live, double reflexivity. And that's many thanks from Christine the Crow, Aka COVID. No, not COVID, COVID, sorry. <laughs> COVID. <laughs> it's a slip that I'm forced to make all the time, um, especially as I have, well, anyway, that, that's the end, and I think that's a record. It's probably just two minutes. So thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful, and I'm determined to be a better meta-meta fiction writer because of it.
Oh, thank, thank you. you. That's lovely. <laughs> okay, so it's me now. Um, me. Now, I'd, li I'd like you all to um, have a piece of paper and a pen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, improvise some stuff on the piano. I don't quite know what it's going to be yet. Um, and what I want you to do is I want you to draw the entropy of the sound. So whatever I play, it won't last for more than a couple of minutes, but I want you to think of a way of drawing the entropy of the sound. And when I finished, I just want you to hold up your picture in front of the camera so that eventually we see all the pictures um, together. And then when, when we record this, I can take a screenshot and we'll get a picture of everybody's picture of entropy of the sound. Okay, so here's, here's, some, here's some sound. I don't know what it's gonna be. They're silent. It's deliberate. It's a triumph of entropy. <laughs> <laughs> now there's the sound of silence. Okay. <laughs> Try to draw the sound of silence. Can you, can you hear me? It's gone. <laughs> yes, of course we can hear you. Okay. What all music games for, Mark? Okay, let's have a look. So hold your pictures up. Okay, that's lovely. Okay, next person is Doug. Can, can people hear me or has it gone completely? Oh, I'm not sure. 
Hello? One of the fascinating things was every so often your head would disappear and your evil twin would pick it up. And I couldn't decide if that was part of the sound or what. <laughs> OK. Uh, can you hear my sound, though? Can you hear me? Yes. Now, yes. OK, all right. OK, I don't know what happened there. Um, Doug, you're next. OK, thanks. Um, first of all, yeah, it was really great. Um, to have you to meet everybody for, for a long time because I've heard of your names, but I haven't been able to. So I'm going to share this. I guess this is the quickest way of me summarizing. This is sort of like the intro of the back cover for my book. It says, the human species is special because we contain general intelligence. Engineers believe that they could build computerized artificial intelligence versions of the human behaviors because they believe our brains are classical computers. But humans are really intelligent living systems that exhibit many extraordinary behaviors that are not possible to produce by purely classical mechanisms of any kind. Extraordinary behaviors are also exhibited by advanced quantum computing machines and thereby creating a technology race investment boom in both AI and quantum computing technologies. The deep reality explored by this book combines these two ideas, quantum computing and AI, in a, in a conversational style between two world-renowned PhD scientists. We propose that our quantum minds exist independently and interact with our individual brains. We share this model by reviewing the research where people have directly interacted with other quantum and probabilistic systems. Our source science model proposes that thought is intimately connected to the science of information protophysics, which is the quantum source of our universe and everything in it. Th this narrative journey just recognizes that information, thought, and meaning are primarily dependent on the hyperdimensional states used by both neural and quantum computing, just like all quantum models, source, source science leads to extraordinary understanding regarding the space-like entangled nature of thoughts, meaning emotion, space, and time. And so that's basically what the book is about. And so I, I challenge you all to question any classical perspective that you have of, uh, and I'm going to stop sharing here, of any classical notions that you have that the system, that if you, you know, damn it, the universe isn't Classical, it's quantum mechanical, right? This is, this is what our famous physicist said, Richard Feynman, and I challenge you all to, to actually believe that in what you're doing, because many people, presentations didn't reflect that reality at all. And so I think that's what AMPA is interested in. I would say consciousness is a weak way of talking about it. Most people use the term consciousness. That's why I prefer real intelligence, because it includes more than just consciousness. It includes mind. <laughs> thoughts and representational aspects of that, okay? So I propose that I'm challenging you all to take AMPA's, what AMPA is about and believe in the model that the universe is quantum mechanical. And what does that mean? Especially if you can show that maybe the mind isn't in the brain at all, especially those who have a neurophysiological or physiology or medical bent. You know, even the physicists have to realize, well, how does that show up? Well, it shows up as bits affecting entropy, which affects everything in quantum mechanics. So I make a prediction here is that all these advanced machines that are really sensitive, like the, like the Large Hadron Collider or the, um, the machine that they use for measuring gravity waves, right? All of those machines you can directly impact with consciousness. And we can set up a targeted example where one day we're just at a certain time, we're going to have target those machines and they'll go off the scale and they're all isolated. They shouldn't be interacting with thought, but they do. And so if you can show that, and they've been shown already in a lot of other experiments that this is true, that the mind can directly interact with quantum mechanics, and that's what we should be interested in as AMPA group, because you're sort of dancing around the subject, but not getting to the point of that subject. So I challenge you all to do that. And that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks Doug. again, Mark, for the great time. No, and for it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, John Torday is next. Oh, can you... <clears throat> show my PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. Yes, now that's going to give me okay. a second. Uh, 
that's a manic Crompton laugh there, I hear. Something's behind you, Mark. Oh, have you not seen that? <laughs> no, what is it? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, hang on, let me share my screen. <laughs> oh, dear. There we are. Um, Looks like a video that he has. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to try and do some a synthesis, an all hubris aside. So in my talk, for those of you who heard it, I talked about the cell as being the origins of life. And I'm saying that Lou and uh, Joe's not knots are actually a manifestation of cells. So in other words, as we twist the cell around through embryology and phylogenetics, we form knots. In the sense that the cell is a surface that distinguishes the bones explicate from the implicate. Um, and so with that idea in mind, um, let's see, how do I advance this thing? Oh, sorry, let me do it. Okay. Okay. So sort of saying is, so we, we, we start with the zygote at this end and the offspring at this end during embryogenesis, it's all mediated by cell cell communications, cell signaling mechanisms that actually generate knots from the unicell. Next. So here, for example, I think the most clear example of that is the glomerulus for the kidney. So this is a kidney and these glomeruli are how we uh, urinate, okay? Uh, it extracts water and ions from the circulation, ergo urination. And I don't think it's terribly hard to imagine that this is actually a knot. Mm -hmm. um, Lou might take, and Joe might take exception to that. That's the way I think about it. Because in fact, it forms from, uh, from a unicellular state the cell signaling mechanisms are totally consistent with with a knot and it can and it is unknotted as we go through the aging process next so here i'm, I'm showing um the uh, phylogeny of the kidney for example so the glomerulus sits here and in fish it's called a glomus and then it became more and more complex that as a vascular structure as we go from left to right from fish to mammals frogs reptiles in between and other organs like the heart and the lung manifest the same kind of progression. <laughs> These are all manifestations of knots. Next. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, obviously, just to say that what I'm really talking about is the, most people talk in terms of synchronic, the real time um, appearance of things. I'm in favor of a diachronic historic approach because that's really where you get the sense of history of the evolution, if you will, of, of process. Next slide. And I think um, Mark drew me into the Zoom that we do on Thursdays and now at AMPA because he realized that my perspective on evolution was, was very similar to Peter's rewrite system. All due respect to Peter, we have discussed this. So the unicellular state is actually a, a homologue of zero in, Mark, in um, Peter's system. And in fact, the way that evolution works is it has to, in order to advance, it has to evaluate what, where it has been to know where it is going. The rewrite system does the same. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. Wow. Well, that's something to think about. Okay, who's next? Mike Horner. Okay, I have picked up the message from a lot of people <clears throat> at AMPA that we should try and think about our own dogmas. I'm now going to read some minutes of a meeting. On a Tuesday evening in March 2019, I introduced five people as we started an evening devoted to extraterrestrials. The event was a men's dining club in Geneva and I was and I am the secretary. Months before I had been approached by my friend Olivier, Olivier to arrange this meeting, which from his point of view was a rehearsal. The same five people were to be the stars of a three-day workshop on extraterrestrials the following weekend. The presentation was scripted as I had insisted and I'd collected questions from the dining club members. According to Olivier, question one, who are the ETs, was answered. For simplicity, let us refer to them as the 14th nation in your galaxy. We refer to ourselves as explorers. There are actually two civilizations among the 14 nations. One civilization is genetically close to Homo sapiens. 
and have interbred. This indicates life exists at least in our galaxy, not just on the Earth. How long have the ETs been on Earth? The most important recorded event was 25,000 years ago. More recently, 800 years ago, there was an event in the Lyon area in France. This event gave rise to a diaspora of groups which we are now representing and we live in the division between France and Spain in the Pyrenees. How is interplanetary travel possible? Earth science is less evolved than most of the other nations, all of the other nations. Our science, in our science, the cosmological model is several levels. Life exists at level three and interplanetary travel is at higher levels. What are you trying to do? We wish to help people on planet Earth. We are translating our cosmology into Earth languages. This is difficult as the underlying assumptions and tools are quite different. We wish to teach our knowledge to people on Earth. Can you give examples of the difficulties you know exist already? Your mathematical system is based on binary logic. We use a full value logic. Olivier was not able to go further because he's not a very scientific guy. Can you give examples of what help you have in mind? We use a non-polluting energy source, which we wish to transfer, but some of the materials do not exist on Earth. This knowledge has been written in ways suitable for use on Earth. The second example is related to the work of Tesla, Nikola Tesla. Tesla developed a non-polluting energy system, but it failed. We can explain why it failed. This should give us credibility. What would be success for you in your over, as your overall project advances? We want to meet people with open minds who will help adapt our knowledge this knowledge may help dealing with your ecological and social problems. We want a true partnership. Unscripted, he told me, and I spent many hours with this guy and the earlier four people, they have tried for hundreds of years to get through to people in power where they've been rejected. They've tried to work with people as knowledge has become closer to what they think is necessary and they have also been rejected. This is the dogma thing again. So I asked him what did he think his success possibilities were, and he said, well, we work in timescales like a thousand years. In a thousand years, for sure, we'll have sorted it out. So I then said, why are you doing things now? He said, well, in 1942 or so, there was this thing called atomic bombs, and we noticed this, the other 14 nations. We would like you to be peaceful and become the 15th nation in the galaxy. Okay. Uh, all right, so Peter Rowlands. Yeah, this is a very short uh, contribution. Um, yesterday, Mike read out a poem to us, of something hopeless, something useless, something worthless. Yeah. And I thought, well, that sounds familiar to me. I've come across something like that before. So how, how much, how contemporary is that kind of writing? Well, I found this, which dates back at least 700 years. <laughs> and I'm going to, yes. This is from uh, Middle English from the 13th century. King counselless, bishop lawless, woman shameless, old man lecher, young man treacher. And then it goes on a bit like that. Uh, but I found that there were, when I looked that up on the internet, I found there were actually 15 different versions. So it must have been incredibly popular mm -hmm. because all these vish versions are different from each other. And there's also a graffito version of the same period. So I think people have been thinking this kind of thing for a long time and nothing changes on that sort of score. Yeah. We still think that politicians and people behave badly and uh, I don't think anything's changed a bit. <laughs> We're going to make the difference. Yeah, of course we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Michael Heather. 
Oh, thank you. Um, uh, life's really wonderful these days, I find, as long as you live, because there's so many conferences you can go to, spend <laughs> all your life. And I really, I really enjoyed uh, uh, just watching this one. I didn't really want to participate. Um, but there's two, two points I'd, I'd like to, to raise. Two principles of AMPA, which were there early on, very early on, but seem to be getting a bit neglected. One of them is minimal assumptions. That's in the uh, statement. By Ted Baston. Totally in with the. Uh, coming today um, and in that sense AMPA led the way but with regard to the assumptions Mike we, I think we've lost your sound and it's it's fixed. Yeah. I think he's lost his connection. We've lost his connection, okay. All right, well, we'll move on and then we'll come back to him. Uh, so, Lou. Lou Vaughan. All right. Let's see. I think if I stand back here, you can see me. Um, yeah. All right. So, I, I want to do a, a little demonstration about, uh, about knots and rope. My arms are knotted. Yeah. My arms are knotted. The knot is on my arms. The, these are uh, the matters of formality. Um, my arms are knotted. The knot exists on my arms. And by continuous deformation, the knot is transferred to the rope. Mm -hmm. So there's an epistemological question. Is it the same knot? <laughs> it's composed of entirely different material. <laughs> what is the nature of the object? What is the nature of the object that is the knot? And this is in back of this is how does something come about from nothing? Um, and in this case, the knot itself uh, doesn't exist except to have a substrate, and yet, uh, and yet, uh, it. It can exist on this substrate or another substrate or any other substrate. This is, of course, the um, the fodder of uh, various mathematical tricks and demonstrations. I have it here again. Here, if you look carefully, there is a knot. It's composed of my arms and the rope. Mm -hmm. But I could say, if I was doing magic, that there is no knot on the rope. And then I say to you again, there is no knot on the rope, and yet now there is a knot on the rope. Um, so, so we have the question of what is the nature of the object? And when you ask what is the nature of the object, uh, you usually think of it in some concrete way. But these objects are objects which are patterns of relationship between certain uh, given uh, a substrate and uh, the space in which they live. And they have a different mode of being, and yet they are still objects. So what is the nature of the object? That is the question. I'm not answering the question. Oh, yes, and a challenge along with Doug's challenge, which may sound like the opposite challenge, but it's not. And the challenge is to not believe in any model that you have, quantum or otherwise. Yeah. How do you make a knot? You <clears throat> make a knot by forming a loop and then stabilizing the loop or self-reference that you have by slipping the rope through the loop and making the knot. That's how it comes into being. And then it has its own stability. And, and yet, I make a knot by doing exactly that. I hope you can see this. And here's the knot. And you see it quite clearly in front of you. And yet, I send it into the higher dimensional space and make it disappear. How did, yeah, thank you. But how did that happen? Let's reveal the trick and quit. Okay. Uh, it happened because I did not do what I said I was going to do. I said, 
that you make a knot by putting a loop and then creating a self-reference and then stabilizing it with get another, uh, a meta meta in Christine's sense. But if I did it in the wrong order, it wouldn't make a knot at all, as you perfectly well see, and it will go away. There are mysteries here. Uh, the mysteries are when, uh, uh, which, which again become part of rope magic, are when you uh, decide uh, to conceal this sort of thing in a, in a more complex manner. So for here's a square knot with a little loop at the bottom, and it's perfectly well knotted, and it's still knotted, uh, and yet now I thread it one more time, and how many, how many meta references is that? But what kind of an object do I have? And in fact, I have no objects at all. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Lou. Um, the, the lovely thing is, you can see everybody's face, and we're all like children when we watch that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 John? Hey. Yes, John Hyatt. I'll just share this. Um, where do you do slide share? Okay, so this is supplementary. Actually, Lou, there's a, there's a great book by Hugh Kenner called The Pound Era, where he talks about Homer's um, Odyssey being a knot, a, a narrative knot that slides onto a different rope with James Joyce's Ulysses. So you might be interested in that. Anyway, I thought I'd undo everything that I did earlier by reversing it so the standard model of physics mathematically allows time to travel in either direction there's no impediment to it according to the known laws of physics of course laws are made by people and can always be broken presently i say somewhat with tongue-in-cheek quantum physics theory suggests that matter space and time do not actually exist at all at the level of the very very small i always suspect things though that need capital letters the latest theory is that the universe we inhabit arises from information, the consequence of immaterial flipping between yes or no. It's all information and the world we walk bursts like lava, solidifying temporarily from its patterns and its waves. So, if time is so flexible, I ask the question, why do we perceive it as travelling in one direction? Clearly one contributory cultural habit is respect for the cause leads to effect hypothesis. Fallen vases shatter, they do not travel back to the table reformed. From this respect, reinforced through multiple observations, we've created our grammar and our language structures. I've undertaken a program of inquiry into the correlation between consciousness, grammar and time. This has involved reversing texts and making still paintings, too, of falling objects. So here's one painted experiment, a painting of a falling vase that I did in 2019. And here's one written exercise using I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by Wordsworth, taken from this series of experiments that I've been doing, which have been ongoing since 2017. So just to remind you the original poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance the waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I can gaze but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my cash I lay, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash on that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So I've taken that poem and I've sucked the arrow of time right out of its target. I've write, been writing reverse texts, is, and it's possibly one of the hardest things I've ever done. What's the reverse, for example, of he loves her? It's not the opposite. 
It's like turning the brain's gears in the other direction for the first time. It really does hurt physically. So I suggest you could try it by trying to write one of your favorite poems by reversing the arrow of time and enjoy my pain. So here's Wordsworth's Daffodils backwards. Befriended, I will stop and rest. The daffodil sat out the next measure. My heart was emptied of all pleasure. The hell of company clashes. Moody, thoughtless, losing track. In these exploding eye flashes, the couch rarely supports my back. Cheap TV shows exploiting poverty will capture eyes, capture all of me. Laughing strangers keep me outside, a potentially miserable poet. Lacking competition, the waves died next to wallflowers on the spot. Shake out life until they die. Ten thousand arrowheads pierce my eye. A shoreline collected them and compressed them to a dot. A black hole's event horizon on a curdled way. Road closed shut. The breeze is stilled. Trees above are calm. The lake is held in rocky palm. Daffodils absorbing purple light into the eye were pressed. Hills and vales sink under a cloud afloat. Befriended, I will stop and rest. That's me. Lovely. Very nice. Very good. There you go. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Okay, Barbara. Okay. Uh, it's... Uh... A, a few loose thoughts that I had. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. A few loose thoughts I had uh, during ANPA presentations. It's actually my my problem with quantum mechanics. It's maybe I was a lousy student, but then I spent half of my working lifetime scattering neutrons from plastics. All right, and uh, I've learned that when you when you take an invisible uh, invisible something we travels in the pipe, it behaves as a wave and then it comes to the, uh, then it scatters from the sample, the, which I can hold and I know how much it weighs and what, and I hope I know what is inside. And then it scatters on the detector and suddenly all the models tell me, okay, it travels as a wave, then it scatters somehow, that will be another wave, which is added up, subtracted, it tells me about the motion of, of what is happening outside, inside the sample. And then it gets registered on the detector as a, as a particle. Well, it's, it's bad enough in, it's as it is, but I have to interpret the signal. Now, uh, when you look at the quantum mechanics, it's, it, nobody likes to tell you that in order to get a response from the sample, you need a lot of the atoms. You need a lot of spins. Something like 10 to the 12th on the, of the 13th in, all, in order to have a signal that you can detect. And what is worse, you can get a sort of uniform signal. Things are getting ordered only at very, very low temperatures. Now, okay, can I detect uh, quantum, uh, quantum phenomena in my body? I'm not at the, uh, at the temperature of 273.15 Kelvin. On the contrary, I'm at a quite high, a, a, a high temperature. And any signal which would be detected from me is completely smeared. And I know, of course, on the theoretical side, when I evaluate my data, fine, I have measured something at higher temperature, even at room temperature. I can apply it by wall factor, so I can take it out and I can try to dig up very deeply to find this damn weak signal from the quantum phenomena. So, and 10 to the 12 is not very much. I won't tell you how much I weigh, but we can assume for the sake of discussion that I weigh something between 65 to 70 kilos. Now you can, uh, you can calculate the amount of, of uh, atoms in my body, amount of cells in my body. And how can I be sure that anything which is measured can really relate to quantum mechanics? 
So uh, and it's not just my original idea. There is an old article by, by Tony Leggett who points out just that, that if you look into sort of uh, material science, you cannot make a bridge, not an easy bridge to quantum mechanics. It seems that they are sort of like two things. So let's think about that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, Richard, next. I said a few minutes ago I wasn't going to talk, and then I realized that I could talk about a different topic. So um, over the last few years, I have been doing a lot of thinking on, well, let's say, somewhere between mythology and sociology and how it re relates to fundamental principles. So uh, let me start with the basics of biology and work my way up to sociology from there. I have uh, an original unicellular being a cyanobacteria. It met with a few others. They collapsed. One of them ate the other. It became mitochondria. And you work your way up to single-celled animals. Um, these get together and you get multicellular collections. Eventually, these multicellular collections coalesce into a higher order um, organism. For the moment, I'll follow animals. Um, by the time you get to animals and you invent um, sexual recombinations, what happens to the larger animal? Well, the animal gel will slough off skin, will slough off fingernails, might lose a little blood. The individual cells get lost. The continuity is only through the, uh, the germ cells. And the rest of the cells are byproducts and you can not have to worry about them very much. Um, eventually, the, the, the um, organisms get together into uh, families, into uh, neighborhoods, regions, uh, communities, nations. And what I'm realizing is I think there's another level of getting together that we're in the middle of now. And um, so uh, the European Union, the United States, the UN are examples of coalitions of some of these larger communities and even larger communities. And a lot of the political issues that are going on are which of the levels is the dominant level? Is it the individual being? Or is it the, the extended family being? The society being? The national being? And I would say for the last 5,000 years since the agricultural revolution, we have been dealing with what is the right level for things to be thought of. And at least in the United States, we're having a major battle between two entirely different images of what the society should look like. And similar things are happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, you know, the issue is the European Union, one union which is indivisible, or is it not? Um, and, and maybe the word K-N-O-T fits in there as well. And also the knot in the back of Corvina. Um, so, what we're finding out is that the, the level of coherence is in, uh, is in transition, whether it's each of us as individuals or as nations or as some larger community. And if it's the larger community, then the individual people don't matter, and just the society as a whole does. Mm. And that is not a conclusion. That's where my observations currently are, and I hope I can come up with something more usable than that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That's a very important thought, I think. Okay, and uh, finally, we got a late entry, uh, Rachel. Okay, Rachel. Um, so I just have a small thing to share. Um, so, Joao, who, who was at the Laws of Forum last year, watched my talk, and then he was asking me if I knew about this Hopf vibration, which I had never heard of. But um, 
as you can see, it's got like this kind of like hula hoop like properties about it and also maybe like the conch seashell. And um, oops. yeah, he sent me this, which <laughs> you go to here. You can see this is like Lou's thing that he held up one day and then that's related to the quaternions and um, some more cool pictures down here. But yeah, so my goal after AMPA, I think, is to investigate this more and get better at math. So yeah, that's it. Oh, and if anyone has any like comments on this thing, uh, please email me because I'm going to explore it a lot. And to come and talk to us again. Um, OK, so uh, actually, a couple of people are waving at me now who uh, Andrew. OK. I got a small thing to show, if anyone... Yes, go on, go, you show your small good, thing. Good, good. I can't see myself, unfortunately. How do I, how do I see myself? Oh, right, OK, well, wait a minute. If I put it on speaker view, if you put it on speaker view, you'll see yourself. Share screen. No, you don't need to share no, screen. I'm not doing it. No, just uh, speaker view is the little um, icon okay. at the top right. Oh, well, you can share the screen. Can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are shapes I did. Um, if you look in, an, in a cone, those are reflections of shapes seen in a cone. I was looking for shapes that are the same in a cone as they are in real life, but rotated. And I did a bit of maths to figure out how to do it very badly. Lou could have helped me here, I feel. And I found there was one very beautiful shape, which is a self anamorph, and that is the heart. You can see the bottom right. Mm -hmm. And now, can you see me? Well, you have to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? Um, stop share, okay. Yeah. Um, can you see me? Yes. I can't see myself. I'm going to, this is very awkward. I'm going to show you a piece of cardboard. Yes. I spent, I wasted a trashed a year of my life inventing this damn piece of cardboard. My God. And if you, can you see it? Yes. yes. If you turn the wheel, a small cone climbs out of the piece of cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> a little higher, a little and higher. And when I look yeah. at that, you see a heart. Wow. The thing oh. like that is made out of mylar. You see a heart reflected as a heart. A self-anamorphic yeah. shape. So here we have, and I, I utterly endorse what Doug said about uh, the mind is the, the mind is out there as well as inside us. So this is a, a, a junction. This is an, it's an eigenform of the inside and the outside. Wow! There you have it. There we go. And I'll now make it vanish. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> oh dear! Okay, it all goes back. Va inside. Valentine's yeah. Day card. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and Nicola has got the hand up as well. <laughs> well, it, it kind of follows, actually, Andrew. It's, um, it's a very short E. Cummings poem, which some of you may already know. And uh, so it's uh, probably got a number. Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the sea to play one day. And Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles. And Millie befriended a stranded star whose rays five languid fingers were. And Molly was chased by a horrible thing that blew bubbles and raced sideways. And May came home with a smooth, with a smooth round stone, as small as a world and as large as alone. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves that we find in the sea. That's it. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, that's it, folks. That, that is the end of Ampa. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mark. Huh? I, I promised you I have two three-minute contributions. And one of them was actually written for you. Would you give me three minutes? Oh, God, okay, yeah. <laughs> I hope it's Sometimes clean. Sometimes <laughs> I like to be a behavioral scientist. My studies are in communication with people always after in the bar. 
Some of my experiments are on a group named That's the Way Things Are. Today I report on a whole page reading experiment. Close to 100% of the study group report that they can read a whole page of text at once. This unexpected capability cannot be predicted, lasts a short time, and is a wonderful experience. John von Neumann and other aliens had the capacity permanently. Speed reading lessons assume everybody can do it. But most significantly in this report, I spoke to my mother as a specialist for children entering school. She said, all children can do that until they are taught how to read properly. I want you to change mode now and think about the text. After the par, after the bar, indicates Stafford Beer. That's the way things are. Maybe you've seen the film Babe. The word aliens indicates all Hungarians and maybe Enrico Fermi. None of these names were mentioned, but I'm sure Mark got them. Change mode again. Taught how to read properly exemplifies out-of-day educational practices. At a certain level, this is the main point. At another level, this is another example of what Alan Watts calls myths and Colin and others have been saying is just dogma, out-of-date thinking. Observations of my own. How is it that this unusual mode, we still understand the meaning? It seems that whether we read the normal way or the whole page at a time, the meaning comes through, possibly as hierarchies of holes, holons. I ask you, like Doug asked, I ask you to consider the work of Joseph Brenner. His internal model, thank you, Wolfgang, all entities have, a, have dual aspects actual and potential. I am exploring this application or the application of Brenner's work. It seems to me the actual aspect requires description compatible with our largely Newtonian 3D plus T space language and it's suitable for our conscious self and our brain. The potential aspect requires a description in which everything is connected to everything else and is the context for the mind and the unconscious. Does this ring any bells? Is this a spooky story? Reading in the proper way implies actual context. The whole page reading lets in the potential and intuition and creativity. Final point. When I come to ANFA, as I have done many, many times, I I'm excited to realize I have these crazy thoughts, but I'm not alone. There are fellow travelers out there. Yes. Thank you very much for stimulating thoughts. I hope that you understood my references, Mark. Yes. Cheers. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I add a, thank you. I add a, no. uh, something that comes from a long way from the past. Please not. This comes, uh, these, um, these sages have all said, there was not then what is, nor what is not. There was no sky and no heaven beyond the sky. What power was there? Where? Who was that power? Was there an abyss of fathomless waters? There was neither death nor immortality then. No signs were there of night or day. The one was breathing by its own power in deep peace. Only the one was, there was nothing beyond. Darkness was hidden in darkness. The all was fluid and formless. Therein, in the void, by the fire of fervor, arose the one. And in the one arose love, love the first seed of the soul. The truth of this the sages found in their hearts. Seeking in their hearts with wisdom, the sages found the bond between the union of being and non-being. Who knows in truth? Who can tell whence and how arose this universe? The gods are later than its beginning. 
Who knows, therefore, whence comes this creation? Only that God who sees in the highest heaven, he only knows whence comes this universe and whether it was made or uncreated. He only knows, or perhaps he knows not. It's a very nice <laughs> That's the, uh, from the Rig Veda. Right, oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Right, look, this, this conference is difficult to close. It, it has been an extraordinary marathon, and I'm immensely... Uh, I, I, I can't really express how I feel. I mean, like all of you, I think I live to learn stuff. And, and I've learned a huge amount over the last six weeks, not just about the content of what people have talked about, but about the ways we can organize ourselves, <laughs> the way we can talk to each other. And it's given me tremendous hope that um, out of this disastrous um, disease that we seem to have at the moment, uh, there we can find new new ways of communicating and that's that's very promising for the future i think i'm also i have to say that the, the um to welcome new members and particularly younger younger members is tremendously heartening and we must continue that um but that's it I, we're over we're finished we will do this again soon um perhaps not quite in this marathon day. Thank you. do it again Thank you very much. I'll, I'll see you soon and I'll send the videos round. Okay. Lovely. All right. See you soon. All the best. Bye. Bye, Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.